Well, happy Thanksgiving. Okay, I just, I just, it's like just silence after happy Thanksgiving. It's a, it's a great time of year to remember what God has blessed us with and to give thanks back to Him. And so as we approach this Thanksgiving week when uh, most of us have some time off, uh, it's a, a good time to remember, and we're going to be talking more about Thanksgiving as we go through the message this morning. We're beginning a new message series called Touching God, and that, that's a hand there. Some of you, what is the picture? What's well, a hand reaching out to touch God? And sometimes we think it might have been great to live when Jesus lived on this earth, to walk with him, to talk with him, to be able to see him, to actually touch him. But yet when Jesus was here, there were only a limited number of people who could actually interact with him. A huge crowd surrounded him at times, and it was very difficult to even get close to him. And that's one of the reasons Jesus had to leave us so that many more people could, as it were, touch him. Jesus said in John 14, verse 16, and I'd encourage you to pull out the white page in the middle of your bulletin. It has an outline uh, with the verses written out there as well as the uh, fill in the blanks. John 14, Jesus said, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. And so after Jesus was raised from the dead, he ascended back into heaven, and he sent the Spirit to live inside of every believer. And it's through the Holy Spirit that we can communicate with God in prayer And through the Holy Spirit, God speaks back to us. And so prayer is actually meant to be two-way communication or conversation with God. In fact, Jesus talks about that a couple verses down. He says, the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I've said to you. And so the Holy Spirit is there to teach us, to talk to us, to help us grow through life. And so in this series, we're going to be focusing on the role of the Holy Spirit in helping us to touch God through prayer. Now this morning, as I was searching, what am I going to talk about this Sunday? I thought, oh, we should talk about Thanksgiving. And so we're going to talk about giving thanks. Uh, And so when we give thanks to somebody, to anybody, but particularly God, we, we acknowledge that there's something we lack that God supplies. We give thanks to him for something that he has done for us. We acknowledge that and we, we thank God. We're grateful to God for his generous gifts to us. And so giving thanks is, is really a fundamental practice of prayer. It should be a daily practice in our prayer for every true believer. In fact, the Bible teaches that really every human being should be grateful and give thanks to God. Romans 1, it's kind of a lengthy verse, but we'll unpack it. Uh, in a minute, it says, men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth, for what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his in- invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse, for although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. But they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. So let's summarize that. Well, these verses tell us that each and every person on the face of this planet should honor and give thanks to God. Why? Because as we simply look around us at creation, as we look around us at the world, the things God has created, the plants, the animals, as we look at the the universe, the stars, the galaxies, God has shown us that he exists. And that has eternal power. And yet, many unbelievers suppress the truth that they know in their heart of hearts to be true. They refuse to acknowledge, honor, and thank God. And so, their thoughts, their thinkings become dark and sinful. And if people would honor and thank God as creator, he would lead them to the truth of salvation in Jesus Christ. And so, as we understand who God is and what he is like this Thanksgiving week, let's let's be reminded to honor him. And thank Him. And not just this week, but all through the year as well. So how can we grow in giving thanks to God? Well, we need to develop some godly attitudes. The attitudes that we think and 
or how we think and feel, the attitudes that we have are incredibly important. They're incredibly important for ourselves. They're incredibly important for others around us. And as we read through the Bible, we find that our attitudes are not uncontrollable. They can be directed by our will as God enables. So what godly attitude should we have? We're going to be looking at a passage in Philippians chapter 4, and it begins by telling us to rejoice at all times. Philippians 4 verse 4 says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. And so in one short verse, we're commanded to rejoice twice. What does it mean to rejoice? To rejoice is to feel and to show great joy, to to show and feel delight and happiness. Now, is this a suggestion? No, it's a command. God is commanding us to rejoice is a choice. It's an act of our will to obey God, to rejoice, to choose to be filled with the joy of the Lord. Now, notice we're not commanded to rejoice in our circumstances, are we? Sometimes... They're not so great. But we are to rejoice what? We are to rejoice in the Lord. To be filled with the joy of the Lord. And we find our joy and happiness in Him first and foremost. Now, God never commands us to do anything that's impossible for us to do. And so this morning, let's rejoice. Let's let God fill our hearts with His joy. Now, the next phrase is, let your reasonableness be known. It means that we should let our our gentle patience be known to everyone. Even when we're in difficult circumstances, even when we may face trouble or persecution, we ought to be filled with gentleness and patience rather than worry, anxiousness, or fear. And when we rejoice, when the going is tough, when we're Filled with joy, even though we face difficult times in our lives, in our families, even in our work, other people are going to notice. And that's one of the ways that we are witnesses by rejoicing at all times. And then we need to replace worry with thanksgiving. Verse 5 continues and says, The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. And so whatever any of us is going through, the Lord is near. And so we shouldn't worry. We shouldn't be anxious about anything. Why? Because we can touch the creator of the universe through prayer. We simply pray. We ask him to meet our needs with thanksgiving and he'll take care of us. Now circle that two-word phrase, with thanksgiving. We are to pray with thanksgiving. All too often, we forget. We need this, we ask God for that, and we forget to give thanks. But this is a command as well. We should pray with thanksgiving. And why should we do that? Well, as we give thanksgiving, we're remembering what God has blessed us with in the past, what He's blessing us today. And we are expressing faith that he's going to bless us in the future as well. And it builds our faith to believe God, to receive more from him as we give thanks. And so the solution to worry and and anxiety is prayer with thanksgiving. And what will be the result as we pray in that way, as we pray with thanksgiving? Well, we're going to receive God's peace. It says, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will Guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And so as we've gone through this short passage this morning so far, the previous verses were full of commands. They were things that we ought to do. We should rejoice. We should let our gentleness be known to everyone. We shouldn't be anxious. We should pray with thanksgiving. And now this is a promise that God has for us. As we do those things, God's peace is going to guard our hearts and guard our minds. God's peace is so wonderful that we can't fully comprehend it. It's the polar opposite of worry, anxiety, and fear. If you're worried, you're not at peace. If you're at peace, you're not worried. And that peace will guard. It's a military term. It it guards us. It protects us 
It protects our hearts. It protects our minds from the enemy's attack. And so as we obey God's instruction through the Spirit's power, we're going to be filled with joy, thanksgiving, and peace. So how can we put these attitudes into practice? Well, I believe it begins with thanksgiving. I think if we give thanks, it prepares our hearts to rejoice. And so every day, think about the blessings that God has brought into your life. Even if every circumstance seems difficult, God has promised to never leave you or forsake you. And so we can give thanks that he's with us. Thank God for his presence with you. Thank him for his past blessings. Thank him for Jesus and what he has done for you. And as you thank him, your faith is going to grow as you ask for his help in your present situation. And as we spend that time in thanksgiving, as we worship him and praise him, and as we give thanks to him, our hearts begin to be prepared to rejoice. We begin to rejoice in the goodness of God in the past, in the answers to prayer that we believe are coming in the future. And we choose not to worry. We make a choice not to worry. When I'm tempted to worry or be anxious or fear, I say, no, I'm going to trust. I'm going to trust God. And I'm going to pray. And as I do that, and as we do that, we're guarded by God's peace. A prayer is very important. It's important for us to pray for our own lives. It's important for us to pray for our own families. And it's important for us to pray for our church family. If you're a member, a regular attender, I'd, I'd encourage you to sign up for our prayer team. It's something we're getting going here. And the only requirement is that you simply make it your goal. But something you're going to try to do to pray at least five minutes a day for the church family. Just five minutes a day to sign up. Simply text the word pray to that number there. And the number is in your bulletin as well. And we'll send you a prayer guide. It'll be updated at least every month. And we'll keep you in our prayer loop. And so I encourage every member and regular attender to sign up. Remember to sign up to be on our prayer team. And as you pray. You're going to stay in that worry-free zone of peace and you're going to make a difference in your life. The passage goes on to tell us about rejecting worldly practices. You know, the battles that we face in our lives are not primarily fought with circumstances. They're fought in our minds. And so when we win the victory in our minds, then other things fall into place. We need to think about good things. Philippians 4.8 says, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. So in this verse, we have a, a long list of adjectives of what we are to think about. And we can summarize, I'm going to summarize this as thinking about good things. These are all good things. And our human tendency, though, is to what? To think about bad things. And we see this reflected where? Uh, big time in our news, right? You watch the news, how many good things are you going to see versus how many bad things? I don't know the percentage, but it's heavily weighted to bad things. Okay, it's 99 to 1. Somebody just told us the percentage of uh, bad things on the news, 99 to 1. And if you spend most of your time thinking about bad things, what's going to be the result? In fact, there are studies done. It correlates depression with the amount of news you watch. Okay, and uh, the more news you watch, the more depressed you're going to be. Why? Because it's just full of bad things. Now, I'm not saying you can never watch the news, but if you spend most of your time thinking about bad things, what is going to be the result? You're going to be anxious. You're going to be worried. You're going to be out of peace. You're ha going to have nothing to give thanks for. But when you think about good things, you're going to be prepared to practice good things. Verse 9, what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. And so Paul, who is writing this letter, tells the church in Philippi to not only think about good things, but to practice the good things. Now, Paul has already set an example by doing. And so thinking about good things, thinking about godly things, will lead us to making good plans. Good plans are going to lead to good practices and good habits that are going to honor God and help other people. And so the things that we think about are incredibly important. 
And the result of that will again be that the peace of God will be in us and protect our lives. We reject worldly practices and live God's way. Now, we all face what we call peer pressure in life. The desire to fit in with the society around us. And peer pressure is not necessarily bad. There's good peer pressure and there's bad peer pressure. Bad peer pressure comes from our culture. It comes from largely from the mass media. Seeking to press us into the mold of the world. It comes from unbelievers and even from believers who may be giving in to worldly practices of gossip or worry. So don't spend too much time with negative news. Don't spend too much time with negative people. Spend, choose to spend your time with positive, godly people in the church family. And one good way to do that is to be part of a life group here in the church. But think about good things. Ask God to help you practice good things. And you're going to be an example that's going to stand out by having an encouraging attitude by, uh, to all those around you. Finally, Paul tells us how to learn to be content. He says in verse 11, I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. And so as we learn to replace worry with thanksgiving, as we learn to rejoice at all times, as we learn to live in God's peace, we are learning to be content. To be content is to be at peace no matter what circumstance or situation that you may find yourself in. To be content is to rise above your circumstances. Paul writes in verse 12, I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. And so how can we be content in any and every circumstance? It, it seems easy to be content when we have plenty, right? When we have an abundance, well, we can be content with that. But how can we be content when things aren't going so well? And Paul says there is a secret. There's a secret that I've learned, a secret that makes it possible to rejoice at all times, a secret that helps us to be people with thankful hearts, a secret that helps us to not worry, a secret that helps us to stand out, in a world that's filled with worry and fear. It's a secret that doesn't come automatically. It's a secret that must be learned. And the secret is to rely on God's strength. Verse 13, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. You know, let's memorize that this morning, okay? Are you ready? Let's, let's, that's not too hard, is it? I didn't make you memorize the one that was full slide. Uh, let's memorize this one, okay? Let's say it together. Ready? I can do all things through him who strengthens me. One more time. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. And for a bonus, the reference, Philippians 4.13. All right, so that's the secret. And we are all on a journey to learning it. And so let's examine this secret in a little more detail. It begins by saying, I can do all things. Now, you know, if you take Scripture out of context, sometimes you can be led really astray. Some people think this means I can do whatever I want. I can do all things, Philippians 4.13a. I can do all things. Nothing is too hard for me to do. But the things that, that's not what it means. The things that you can do are the good things that we've just heard we're supposed to think about. The good things that you can do are the good things that God is calling you to do. They're not anything you might want to do. And how can we do those things? Not in our own strength, but through him that is Christ. And how does Christ, how does Jesus help us to do all things? By strengthening us, or actually, I think better translated, by empowering us. We are not strong enough. We are too weak in and of ourselves, to do what God calls us to do. But when we humble ourselves, we acknowledge our weakness, we say, I'm not strong enough. I can't do this. God, I need your help. He gives us the strength to do everything that he asks of us. And when we truly learn that secret, we can be content in any situation. Because all we have to do is do what God tells us to do, and he's giving us the strength to do it. And we can be content. 
knowing that we're pleasing the Lord. I'd like us to watch a video that I believe illustrates the connection between thanksgiving and contentment. It's really about giving thanks in every situation. But as we watch the video, you're going to see that as we give thanks, we're going to be content. It's called the Thanksgiving chair, the Thanksgiving chair. We are to give thanks in all circumstances. God can give us the strength to give thanks. He can remind us as we seek to please Him. And as we give thanks, God will bring His peace and contentment into our lives. And so this Thanksgiving, let's rejoice. Let's give thanks to God for His blessings. And rather than worry about the future, God wants us to be content in our situation. We can be content because we can do everything that God calls us to do. Some things may be more difficult than others, but he's going to give us the strength to do it through Christ who empowers us. Now to have that strength of Christ within us, to have his Holy Spirit living within us, we need to be followers of Jesus Christ. We need to put our faith and trust in him. For the very first time, if we haven't already done it. And to become a believer, according to the Bible, we need to admit that we've sinned. We need to believe that Jesus died on the cross, that our sins might be forgiven. And we need to commit our life to following him. So let's bow our heads right now. We're going to pray a simple prayer. And if you'd like to commit your life to Jesus Christ for the first time, or perhaps to recommit your life to him, I'd encourage you to pray along with me. Something like this. Father... Today I admit that I've sinned. I've I've done wrong things. Please forgive me. I believe that Jesus died on the cross, paid the penalty for my sin that I might be forgiven. I believe he rose from the dead three days later and I commit my life to following him and his plan for my life. And for all of us, let's pray as well. Father, today we want to thank you for all your blessings in our lives, God. We want to thank you for the blessing of being part of our church family. And most importantly, we thank you for the blessing of being saved through Jesus Christ and having eternal life. We thank you for the friendships that we have with our brothers and sisters in the Lord as we work to extend your kingdom here in St. Louis. We're grateful for our families, for our spouses, for our parents, for our, for our children. We thank you that you have promised to provide for all of our needs as we seek your kingdom first. God, we thank you for the country that we live in that gives us the privilege of worshiping you freely. And today we ask that you help us to remember to give thanks and to rejoice in you each and every day. Forgive us for the times that we've given in to worry and anxiety, God. But help us to give thanks. Teach us to learn the secret to being content. That we can do all things that you ask of us through Jesus Christ who strengthens us. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen.